please introduce yourself, Colin. Cool. Uh, I'm Colin Van Steyck, the founder and head distiller of Jaga Rum in Orkney. Uh, we produce rum on Lamb Home in Orkney, which is a tiny island joined to Orkney by the Churchill Barriers, which were built by prisoners of war in uh, World War II, Italian prisoners of war. Um, so it is, it is joined to the mainland, but it's still technically an island. And it's 0.15 square miles, so it's possibly the smallest rum producing island in the world. Yeah, yeah. And there have been some people that have said, oh, I know this one and they're smaller. And then you go on Google Maps and measure and it's way bigger. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, we started in, well, a company was started in 2016. We got our distilling license in 2017 and have been busy filling casks ever since. Yeah. Pretty much. Good. Good. And you do some inter you've got some interesting stuff as well, which we'll go up, we'll go on about all of that as well. Um, because you guys have come up quite a bit uh talking about fermentations. Um where did you I think first of all, where did you, you know, you're you know, you're young, you know. Um I'm yes. young. I'm not I'm not I'm not oldish either. I'm I'm young, I still think I'm young. <laughs> um <laughs> you your family are involved in so as you, your father had the Orkney Wine Company or has the Orkney Wine Company. Still does, yeah. 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 And that was something, um, you know, reading up about you guys and looking into your kind of bios, you know, where you come from. And you could have you could have fallen suit with that, but you didn't. You decided you wanted to take it on a different level. What brought you into, you know, what, what brought you into doing rum and coming back to the family? Where were you before that as well, may I ask? If you want uh, to I was talking, well, I've worked for dad's company like on and off since like the age of 12. We've been helping bottling. There's photos of me like about this high in the cork machine, like way up here. And it's nice. Yeah, just been doing that. And then uh, I worked for him for a year after I left school and then just saved up money and moved to Edinburgh to do whatever. <laughs> whatever you fancied. Yeah, and then ended up being the manager of an indoor skate park uh, and, like, skate teacher for, like, five and a bit years. Nice. And then my brother sort of rejoined the family business, and I thought I quite fancied it too. So we sort of took turns uh, coming up here, working in the shop and being in Edinburgh and all over Scotland doing sales for the company. So Nice. Um, and then I think it was... 2014 or 15, we started sort of toying with the idea of what if we did run sort of thing. So, mm. okay, interesting. And now you are doing run. Yeah, exactly. And well, and well established in run as well. So, what um, did you? Yeah, because sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no, please go ahead. Go uh, yeah, because my dad was sort of leaning towards like trying to get me to take over the wine side of things. And um, because he's always thought I had that in me, like the sort of flair to mix random fruits and make something good. Um, but yeah, but instead of doing that, I fancied, fancied rum. Just taking your own pathway as well. Yeah, pretty much. And the space was, well, sort of. <laughs> so <laughs> sort of just pushed his stuff a bit to the side and stuck my stuff in. So. Nice. So it's still very much kind of family business, you know. Definitely, yeah. But yeah, they still get that integration of the family. And Jay Gow, you know, where's the... I'm always intrigued, and the more you read into... Uh, I'll let you, obviously, say what, you know, where the name comes from. Um, but there's all, you know, there's fast... Rum is, obviously, islands, you know, mercantiles, the merchanteers, you know, people talk about the privateers, the pirates, you know, and, and there's that symbolism that comes from your name as well. Um, so where does that, you know, for everyone out there that doesn't know um, or just introducing you, where does, where does the name Jay, Jay Gow come from? Uh, yeah, Jay Gow is, uh, comes from John Gow. Uh, he was an 18th century pirate from Orkney. Well, from Caithness, but uh, he grew up in Orkney, so we sort of claimed him as our own. Um, and he was captured just off ED, which is one of the smaller islands here, mm. uh, after a ship ran aground. And then he was arrested, tried and hanged in London's executioner dock in 1725. But he was actually hanged twice because the rope snapped the first time. So, 
Brilliant. pretty grim end, but there's so many different stories about them. Like you keep hearing different versions of things, and it's just amazing. I love it. But there's so much history that way. Um, I've had, you know, I've had the beauty of when I worked with Athens. I got to work with um, Ian Williams, um, sort of author, um, uh, about rewriting kind of Appleton's history and what came around there and working with other people as well. And you find there's so many loops that come in and not just with their history, but history about, you know, privateers or, or pirates, you know, that yeah. come from around Scotland that are involved in, in, in the trade or, you know, what was part of the trade and what was their life and the stories that went on behind it. You know, and there's a lot of darkness to it as well. We, we say that all the time, you know, and, you know, there's always this kind of more modern movement of Scottish rum, which is now happening. And I was just talking to my, my business partner there and I, and I said to him, you know what? I, I mean, I said, I'm having a, such a great day today. You know, you're ending off with yourself uh, today talking about your rums. Um, and it's, it's really interesting just the innovation and where Scottish rum, you know, is coming to. So we're going to do, I think you're going to take me to a tasting of your rum, the Jay Gow Revenge. Yep. Is that right? 43%. So I've got three-year-old bourbon and virgin oak. And you're doing things, um, well, you're doing things in your own style. So what would you say is, you know, as we go into this tasting, what would you say is your kind of style for the rums? You know, where did you get your inspiration for and your creativity towards the production of the rums? Hey, well, I like the sort of heavier, more full-bodied side of things, um, which is, well, 100% pop still obviously helps with that as well. Not like mm. we were going to stick in a column in here anywhere. <laughs> but, you know what I mean? It's um, That's the style I was wanting to go for anyway. And it's that sort of, yeah, the sort of higher ester sort of stuff is what I'm leaning towards, but obviously not so high ester that it puts people off like obviously there's a definite market for it but it's not it's not like 100 that mainstream so yeah i just want to create yeah just good sort of full-bodied decent rum pretty much yeah we're talking about this with sugar house and uh, you know we're talking about we're saying you know it's great and they're going for an overproof and this we we're talking about you as well and you know i was harking back to stuff like ray nephew and you know it's it's an acquired taste at some times, you know, a lot of bartenders would think, you know, you're coming in and we're laughing because they'd always offer you like, a, you know, a Ray Daiquiri and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, it's an amazing spirit. It's not something that, you know, it, boots the, it can it can boot the teeth out of you. It's a, it, you've got to be, there's, there's a way of drinking these styles of rum, you know, without me coming across like, you know, you shouldn't touch these rums or they're too heavy or this. Yeah. But there are, they, they, you know, and that's the thing with rum. There's so many different styles. And again, it's just been so interesting talking to each one of you about the differences of what you're doing, you know, from fermentation, from molasses, you know, what stills you're all applying as well. If, you know, someone's actually producing from scratch as well. Um, and you're going through a variety of different sort of caskings as well. I remember seeing your... Uh, chestnut uh, cask. Yeah, but just there's one. That one there is chestnut. <laughs> Actually, interesting. Uh, what what brought you to what brought you to do that? You know, while we uh, to, the, well, just researching things, and obviously rum isn't limited to just oak like whiskey. So I was like, right, what else is there? Let's have a look, and then I uh, found some really good studies by I think the OIB. It was like some. Mm -hmm. In France, and they've been doing some experiments with long-term aging of brandy in chestnut and comparing it to oak, basically, and yeah. doing all the volatiles and all the different compounds and everything. And I was like, well, that could be really well suited to us because obviously mainland Scotland, what's the angel share in whiskey is like 2 to 4% or something. Um, in Orkney, it's, it can be even lower because it's colder and more mild. So yeah, is that right? what can we do that to sort of, you know, have something a bit different, something that isn't that slow. And then, well, chestnut came up because it is, it's more porous. So yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say you get faster maturation because I don't think you can cheat time. There is no such thing as speeding it up really, but because it is more porous, there is definitely, well, yeah, more, more uh, interaction between the oxygen and, the alcohol and the wood that way. So you lose more, but... <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, 
I think that's the beauty of you being able to, or and wanting to experiment. You know, they talk about like American oaks, slightly, it's more porous, but it's the rigor the norm as well. And then, you know, on a racial value to what people might say is porous, you know, you've then got chestnut, things like a, you know, like a native oak to, to the UK is far more porous as well. Much like things like the Japanese oak, you know, there's a, there is a, a much more porous element there and, yeah. you know, minimal, more, you know, much lesser quantities are used, but that's the ability of, you know, the, or the excitement of doing something that's, you know, so experimental um, and such a change. And you've got a lot, you, how, how, what, how much have you actually got in cask? Uh, we have mid, mid sort of 60s at the minute, hmm. right around 65-ish casks, um, but that'll be going up to, we've got another 10 to do sort of in the, over the next month and a bit, and then Nice. Another, another few, and then back to some experimental stuff that I want to do. It's just, there's so much nice. normal production I have to do yeah. now uh, because the revenge like totally worked. <laughs> That's good though. I to- yeah, it's awesome. Um, but so I, I, like, there's so much experimentation I want to do, but it's hard to get the the time on the the big still to do it really. So. Well, let's have a taste of uh, of the Jager yeah. revenge then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is this a pure? Is this a pure three year old? Yes. Uh, well, three years and a day. So mm-hmm. obviously I had to had to do that just to make sure. Yeah. And <laughs> um, so it's a blend of, it's I'd say seventy five percent of our HD mark. Yeah. Which stands for heavy dunder or high dunder, whatever you want to say. Um, so that in that we reuse all the back set from a previous strip and run. In the next two fermentations, and then we add uh, like muck from the pit as well, which is just yeah, back set and yeast lees and just all sorts of stuff that we've just let let go, let it get funky pretty much. <laughs> Where do you while we're on that subject? Because that that was two things that really intri- or have always intrigued me as well. Because Ray nephew, you, you never got to see the Dunder pits. Anyone that did get to see the Dunder pits was you know. Either you went there by mistake, and someone just like <laughs> so privileged, um, and you know these are you're talking about massive thunder pits, you know that are sitting there with a lot of muck, and you know there's stories that go through the years about goats falling in and so on and so forth. Where are your? How do you keep your thunder? What are you doing with your your thunder? Uh, well, ours is just stored in a thousand liter IBC, so it's mm. nice. Yeah, but it's a, it's around nine hundred liters that we, we keep it at. Yeah, um, and it has a really massive pellicle on it with loads of bubbles, and it looks pretty gnarly. Yeah, I bet. Very good. Uh, be it's it's fine here because it is colder. That um, obviously through like the winter months, it's fairly dormant. But then and when it gets warmer in here, it, yeah, it fairly kicks up a stink. <laughs> nice. Uh, one day I'll if I can get I'll, I'll get along to hopefully see you guys at some point and uh, that'd be awesome. Love to see that because everyone's so intrigued and I think there's a few companies now that are really kind of looking into kind of dunder um, and doing process much like yourself and it is you know I think this is again you go back to this is how intriguing rum is you know, it's not there are so many different ways of application you know and it's not set to any kind of general rule and there are obviously things for different Caribbean countries and GI and so on and territory. Um, but I think that's the beauty of it. You know, and it's so interesting hearing about producers like yourself, what you're doing, how you're doing it, the experimentation of it all. Um, but yeah, let's let's get into the run at the moment. So that's a, so yeah, that's a 14 day fermentation on the HD side of things. And then that HD part is all ex bourbon. And then the DS, which is just double strip or double strength, whatever, that's basically had an extra stripping run. So it's, yeah, it comes out at a higher ABV, so you get a bit more reflux rectification in the, the packed column above the still. Um, it's a bit lighter. And then that's that part's done in New Oak. And the New Oak's just there just to give it that, that sort of hit of sweetness, really. And then you get the sort of, dried fruit and spice and I, I get quite a heavy sort of peachiness on the finish from it but that's from the HD side of things. Yeah there's a bit of stone fruit coming through there. Yeah definitely stone fruit I think that's quite present in most of my rums but 
There's a lot That's of cool. the that kicks out from that oak as well, which is really nice, actually. And it is really complimenting, you know, it's got a great nose, you know, it's got a powerful nose. And then you come into it, you know, and there's, it's, it's very fresh rum as well. You know, you can still get the alcohol, you still get a little bit of bite. Yeah, but there's that real sort of balance of sweetness coming through and kind of freshness that comes through the rum as well, which is really, really nice. And what was the what was the use of uh, what was the what was the thought behind uh, using the word revenge? Uh, revenge was the name of John Gow's ship, mm. so it made total sense. It's a pretty great name for a rum as well. Absolutely, I like I like the the, the naming that you've been doing with your rums as well. Yeah. I was them and I was like. I like I like what you're doing. I like where you're coming from and how you're. I like to keep it like sort of quite like metal. I'm also going metal, and metal. <laughs> so, yeah, well, and uh, more more that side of things. But <laughs> they'll incorporate in elements of John Gow's story as well, but yeah, without yeah, going yeah. into like the cheesy elements of like no, commercial no. pirate themed stuff. And, yeah, and trying to pirates, but classy. Yeah. But it's got to have that, it's got to have like an element of like, I, th I think it definitely, you know, speaking to you, you know, even reading about you guys and reading about yourself, but then speaking to you, I think it's definitely got that element of your personality that's going into the brand as well as having that backstory about someone, which gives it that kind of heritage. You know, some, I think some of the rum companies are saying that, you know, they, they don't have they don't want that element of storytelling they want. But it, this is why I, I think everyone's so different and it's really, really good. It's so exciting to see the differences of how everyone's coming about with something because it's so, you know, Scott, rum in Scotland's not new to Scotland, but Scottish rum itself is, you know, pretty new yeah. on the modern market, you know, and everyone's making their own kind of marks, you know, how rum is. People might think, you know, what kind of style are you looking for? But then look at the whiskey industry, you know, and even then you can go now look at Lowland whiskies that are heavily peated, you know, I think yeah. maybe different for the Isley whiskies, obviously. But, you know, you're going back to even styles that were going back to a long time ago when, you know, different styles of machinery and worm tubs and very big oily whiskies as well. And I think that's interesting because you're getting this really cool, diverse range of rum that's coming out. And that is a really, I mean, so far, I mean, I've had a few rums today. Um, it's nice. And I have to say they're all, and I'm not lying, they're all, they've all been brilliant rums, like really well balanced. You know, we had a spice drum earlier on from uh, Brewdog, from Jamie Muir. You know, and even with that, kind of bringing the, the alcohol levels down, brilliant, you know. Why did you choose to do 43%? Uh, uh, just it's still approachable enough for people because some people think that 40 is strong I don't, I don't know why I don't get that <laughs> but 43 it just it just retains that that little bit more bite that just there's more body to it um, yeah that, well, I, I just preferred it I think that's interesting because you get a lot of people and they try it and then they go oh that's strong Yeah, you know, just the fact that it's spiritus and then you say to them you know, but most vodkas are 40%. And they're like, yeah. are they? And you're like, yeah. It's because most people aren't drinking it neat. So yeah, no. that's the thing. They're like, oh. But it's that first sip just to mm. get your palate ready. And it's the second sip where you do the, the real tasting, I guess. And that's, that's true. <laughs> Climatizing the palate to the. Yeah, especially if you like people that come in the shop and they've not had any breakfast. And it's like, well, you know, what did you expect? <laughs> you expect from that. And if it's not a bar, a bartender might be used to that, um, depending yeah. on what they do. And how we do you did, like, how we, do you like the rum? Oh, sorry, go on. Uh, we did do a single cask release last year uh, that was fifty three percent. That was a fair bit stronger. So, and how was that received? Really well. Uh, it sold out in under two weeks, so it was good. <laughs> I, I love hearing about stuff, and so well, sometimes I love hearing about it, though I missed like ninefold as well, um, for various reasons. I never like, well, you didn't, you didn't buy any of the things. I said, no, and now I need, you know, now I need to go back and try and find these things, which I don't mind. I like the case of these little holy grails as well, and trying to find them again. And when you do get them, because you're not going to sit on them, you know, I want to be able. That's the one thing with rum, you want to be able to try rum, you know. And, yeah. There is rum, you can't, you know, if you can get a couple of balls, two or three balls and you stick one away, yeah, fair play, why not? But 
you really do want to try them for the effort that people are going into and what they're doing and how unique these are. How do you, how do you like, I take it you like to drink your rum neat probably, maybe over ice. How do you like to take your rum? Uh, my own rum or is it any rum? Well, your own rum to start with. Um, right, this might offend some people, but I am quite partial to uh, Revenge and Pepsi Max. <laughs> 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 I just, like, when you come home and you're not, you like you don't fancy a beer. You're not just going to get fired into straight spirit. Yeah. So you want a longer drink, and I just think it's it's totally banging in the rum and coke. Totally, and I think um, not- obviously, like it, it works just as well straight as well. And there's some amazing cocktails that it works in. It having that quite heavy bourbon cask element, it obviously lends itself quite well to cocktails that would use bourbon normally. So you can yeah. sub it, sub them out for revenge instead. They work really well. Yeah, you do. And do you find that? You know, we're talking to some of the other producers and there's a, a real interest in the honesty that comes about because a lot of the producers, I think because, you know, the market's still young and it's still growing and a lot of the producers aren't scared to talk about, you know, my rum, not all, you know, you get a lot of the big brand companies and they're like, you can make, you know, I used to get all, I used to always get pissy because people would be like, you know, you can put that in a Mai Tai and you're like, mm, can you really, you can, but at the end of the day, the drink itself needs something that's a big rum. You know, these yeah. are pot still style rums that came in with, even if it was agricole on top of it, you know, and they were punchy, you know, and they added to certain flavors and dynamics to the drink. You know, are you that way inclined? You know, how, how what, you know, you like Pepsi Max, what other kind of styles do you think work really well with the drink? Well, with the revenge. With the revenge and the rum. Uh, well, the signature sour for it is the, well, the Pirate's Tail cocktail, mm-hmm. which is, pretty much just a lion's tail bourbon cocktail but we've subbed out the changed some of the the measurements but subbed it out for revenge so that's yeah, it's revenge all spice dram or mental dram um lime juice sugar syrup and bitters and that's it so it's heavy on the all spice but the rum definitely holds its own in it and it's oh it's so moorish like they're really really good nice sounds good I've been having a few drinks. I'm dying for a few cocktails at some point, but I don't think it's going to be tonight. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. So where do you think, where, where, are you, where are you going next? There's been a lot of talk about things like fermentation. You're obviously into, you know, experimentation quite a lot. Where where do you see yourself going next with some of the, the rums in the production? Uh, well, we have a very limited amount of uh, currently unaged wild yeast rum and that we're, we will be releasing it at some point, probably at a ridiculously high strength. <laughs> okay. It's it's high ester. It's it's pretty crazy. It was a ridiculously low yield on it as well because yeah. it's not a commercial yeast, and it was my first go doing it at two thousand liters, which is it doesn't always scale up the same if you're doing experiments at twenty liters. Yeah. Even scaling up to 100, it would sometimes behave completely differently to how it did at 20. And then at 2000, it was just crazy different again. But that's yeast that we've got from wild orchids that grow just beside the distillery. So it's nice. like a native native yeast from the island. Uh, so we were hoping to do that, try and do that sort of every year Brilliant. and get like a yearly batch of that on the go. And then, uh, yeah, we've got a couple other things coming out that we can't talk about <laughs> but, yeah. uh, the main the main next big one will be the hidden depths volume two which was the second volume of the cast strength one we did last year and um, that'll be sort of towards the end of next year but that'll be a five-year-old but uh, it's exactly the same rum we have but it's uh, yeah, it's been put down into three completely different casks. So one will be, the first one was three, this will be five, and then probably seven for the, the final installment of that series. That's nice. And That's then just, just waiting, really waiting for like these to reach eight and 12 and yeah. keep filling casks, really, in the meantime. And do you think there's a, do you think, you know, we're talking about, you know, aging up to eight and to 12, do you think there's going to be a, a sort of limit to where you age or or what you feel the aging is or do you do you feel you might want to experiment a little bit more just just for the pure sake of experimenting oh yeah definitely if i can hold off and keep a few away for mm. for a lot longer then 
that's my pension sorted, you know. <laughs> that, that is only thing. It's not a bad thing, you know. Some people say they always find it amazing in 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 Jamaica when they're like, you know, you get that bottle. You know, how many more bottles have you got of that? Oh no, I sold at auction. How much did they go for? And you're like, oh, I went for this many. They're like, damn. And you're like, why, guys? Oh, I just drank two at the beach with the game, you know, just for kicks. And you're like. Yeah, but that's that's the same. You've got to enjoy it as well at the same time. Yeah, definitely. Rum is now finding its feet, you know, in the auction market. You know, you've seen that. There's some really big punchy rums that have come out there. And I think especially, I was just talking to some friends, it's one that's also there for the future for collecting. If, you know, and, and why not look at it like you could have your pension or, you know, something tucked away, you want an extension done in the house. You know, why not? You're seeing it with the young producers of whiskey and you should be seeing it, you know, again with the, the rum producers, which is quite cool. I look forward to, to more of your stuff coming out as well. But I don't think I don't think they're we're gonna cap it with a certain age limit. It'll just be just entirely dependent on the stocks, I think. Because it's not it's not the Caribbean here, so I don't think we're gonna no. over oak anything too easily. Like no, and I think that's the beauty of it. I think there's there's still that element of we miss talking to a producer on Friday night and you're talking about, you know, and you think about some of the older continental styles or the way that they were worded, you know, but there is that, you know, you don't have that element, you know, we're not like Mexico, we're not like Caribbean, you know, we don't have that 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 loss of evaporation, you know, so you do have, of, of course, there's going to be a time, you know, time costs anyone money, you know, at the end of the day, but then I think that's what's intriguing, you know, what will come out at the end, you know, from all your experimenting, your production, you know, sitting back, waiting, you know, and the, the patience of it all at the end of the day, you know, and the beauty that comes out from that patience. Really interesting. Anything in the more immediate future uh, coming through, do you think? What's what, I mean, are you travelling again? You know, you stuck really doing more production? Uh, yeah, just trying to, we only really did last year's production uh in sort of december and january mm. like this year so it's we were a bit behind with that so just trying to catch up now i've got a massive order of molasses coming in so we'll be really busy getting sort of the next lot of revenge done and uh, the eight-year-old and stuff of like that put away and nice. yeah um we normally have staff in the shop running the shop, obviously due to everything that happened. We were only open 10 weeks last year, so we we don't have any other staff anymore. So it's myself that's in the shop as well. Yeah. And July, July and August are the sort of busiest time. So and you miss that'll be what we'll be doing in there. And then trying to do production in between and hopefully get the tours going again as well. Yeah, that'd, that'd be, be good. As you, and then you maybe, you know, maybe. Are you open for tours? Not, uh, not normally, yeah. Maybe. Yeah, but we're hoping to get them going again because, yeah, just smaller groups and we could probably do it. Yeah, because you're more oh. of a, you, you, are you, are you still quite the one-man band, you know, like going out, doing the, the trade shows, presenting, ambassadors. Yeah, very much so, yeah. And do you like my, dad, my, my dad is sort of involved with, like, bottling and filling casts. That's, like, two-man job, but, like, everything else, like, you know, label design, going to rum festivals and all that stuff that's yeah that's on me like so it's good though i mean that's i mean it's brilliant it's quite an achievement i was even um uh i just happened to even read the one of the, the documents uh, you're talking about the accountancy firm that you're using but all these things are interesting they're interesting for people who want to start developing rum but it's intriguing for people to look at it to understand that because you don't you just don't have that time you know i was yeah. talking to my mates the other week and they were like you know, how many people are involved in your business? And I said, oh, well, there's, you know, there's me and I've got a partner, you know, and things have been slow, especially the last um, sort of year or so and blah, blah, blah. Oh, we've got five people and you're like, oh, lucky you, you bugger, you know. But there is that, there's that love of it. And do you miss, do you miss the travel? Do you miss, you know, the trade shows and... Some of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> some of them be a bit full on. So, some of them are definitely more enjoyable than others but some of them you just feel like you sort of have to do them yeah um last year would have been our biggest i think we had 13 like 
shows booked so it would have been away sure. like at least once a month and then there was a couple of others that we were thinking of doing as well but obviously mm. all of them except the Scottish Rum Festival went ahead so yeah yeah it'd be nice to get out to sort of rum festivals again and just because we have we have more products now we've got the revenge as well it's a, yeah be good to showcase it in front of people again but I think yeah we'll just have to see what happens really but hoping hoping near the end of the year to sort of get some time to get off the island and yeah punt, punt my wares somewhere <laughs> when, when do you think you'll be open again for uh, distillery tours like properly and fully and I will probably open over the next couple of weeks I think just to just to get maybe yeah, groups of four in, that'd be fine space-wise. I think any bigger than that. And it just it depends on, like, the households and things like that, I guess. It's if, it's, if it's one one big group, then I think it'd be grand. Like. I think everyone's got to be... I think you've still got to be careful and considerate. That's the thing, and you don't want to... You know, you're putting so much effort into it, and especially, you know, there's been so, so much change the last kind of year, 14 months, you know, and... I don't think, you know, a month or two is going to make much difference in the scale of things with people coming. And we do just need to be mindful of that, I think. But yeah. it's exciting. It's exciting hearing things are going to open up again, uh, you know, and you're going to be able to travel out. Um, and I'm saying that I'd love to go and see you guys. I'd love to go and see Ninefold. You know, I'd love to see some of our guys as well. And, you know, if they're, they're able to accept people, um, you know, and really sort of get to see the grit of what's going on. And, you know, and you get to geek out a little bit more as well that's one thing you know it's great being virtual um, and it's exciting you know it's great Scottish Run Fest to, you know coming up for its second year in the second year but getting out there you know and actually you know touching and feeling and having the physical elements you know and getting to see people is completely different yeah definitely so what do you think what do you think is the next stage for for Scottish Run you know where there's lots of innovation you know there's a lot of excitement what do you feel is the next chapter for Scottish Run uh, well, we're sort of working on it with some of the other distilleries behind the scenes, uh, oh, nice. getting the association of Scottish rum together um, just to try and get some guidelines out there for people and try and get a sort of common interest together, you know, just yeah. to protect the Scottish element of it. So yeah. it's not bought in molasses based GNS or bought yeah. in from another country and you've, you've added whatever and you're calling it Scottish it's like just call it what it is label, label it correctly pretty much yeah there is that that was interesting because that's a conversation we had earlier on it you know they mentioned that there was a few of you bringing up a trade group which is I think is brilliant you know and more the better for that and communication you know communication yeah. not maybe not to be snobbish about it but you know if there's a lot of hard work and effort going into it you know, where does that next stage go? And it, and it is about labelling, you know, getting to that point where I think you're all being very careful and clear about what you're doing. You don't want that diluted. If that's yeah, true. totally. You know, and, and that is, I think that's going to stand for the good test of time for Scotland and for the rum, um, especially when you've seen all, you know, various other markets that are now awash with various labelling and marketing that you you really just don't know what's at the back end of it. That's the thing. You know, yeah. which is what I love about rum. Um, you know, and I think I've always loved that. I think people mistake sometimes the clarity in, in the different regions and what people do, but then each island's so different. And then you get, you know, an influx of big corporation as well. But then that's the beauty of it. And now you're seeing so much rum that's been dealt with and how it's being translated or how it's been communicated in Scotland is really, really cool. There's a lot of exciting stuff going on, which I think is amazing. Yeah, and most of the producers are being quite open on their labels as well, like about no added sugar, no colouring, like yeah, all that sort of stuff, which is I think is better for the consumer in the end because Absolutely. we need to get rid of <laughs> some of the the old terminology for rum because it's yeah, you don't ask for a dark whiskey, do you? Well, no, you don't. You know, I mean, and there's you know there's. People are still mass, even people are still confused about whiskey at some points. And then, you know, do you want that confusion to, to run into rum and to what it is? I had someone uh, a while back and then they said, you know, what, what is it you've done? And, you know, what kind of style is it? Golden is this? And I was like, no, it's not. But 
I don't know how to convey that across to you. And, you know, and we were talking about earlier with Sugar House, how I love the simplicity of, you know, we've got a spice drum, you know, we've got botanical rums that are coming out. Uh, you know, essentially they are very much the same as a flavour cell rum. And then we've got, you know, following the same route as some of the Caribbean element, you know, like the Guardians are on, there's that kind of pure single and how that then balances. And there is some difficulty still, because if I think about the wording of Scotch at times and the whole categorization, you know, there's still levels that you think, oh, that could be quite, con if the cat, you know, how does the Scot, how does Scotland run with what it's doing versus Caribbean? Because there's still elements that I think are quite confusing that have to be, figured out and communicated correctly over there yeah definitely that's something that we're we'll we'll figure that out for sure yeah, definitely and the future is good yeah. thank you very much thank you for your yeah, time thank you for the rum tasting uh look forward to seeing Pleasure. you at the rum festival and hopefully yeah. i look forward to seeing you soon uh over in orkney i'll come and visit yeah just there. let let me know when you're we'll do we'll keep it when tough. you're headed over i'll give you the the good tour <laughs> <laughs> the, or the vip tour as some people say oh, yeah. <laughs> any any food will be amazing. And thank you very much. Thank you, Cole. Okay, Have a good no night. problem at all. Yeah. Thank you, my Cheers. friend. Cheers. Cheers.